Welcome to the Korea Society's video series, Author Talks. Many American readers got to know you, Miri, in 2020 when Morgan Giles' translation of Tokyo Winner Station won the National Book Award in Translated Literature. What they may not know is that the Korean author writing in Japanese has published over 20 books to her name. Yumiri was born to Korean parents in Japan, and she is known for bringing a razor sharp, quote unquote, outsider perspective to her work, writing about those who have been pushed into the margins of the society. The End of August is a spellbinding, multi generational saga based on Yumiri's own family history filled with death, love, betrayal, war, political upheaval, and ghosts. First serialized in Japan and Korea in the early 2000s and published as a novel there in 2004, the English translation, once again by Morgan Giles, is now available in the U.S. And we are thrilled to have you, Miri, here at the Korea Society. Welcome to the Korea Society. It is great to have you here. I'm glad to be here also. This is my last day in New York, actually, and to be able to be here today is special, and I'm glad. The end of August is known as a semi-autobiographical investigation, or it is a story about your own family inspired inspired especially by your maternal grandfather's life. Why did you decide to investigate, so to speak, or tell the story of your family? Was the story of your grandfather something you were familiar with when you were growing up or something you had to sort of seek out and find out as an adult and as a, a writer? When I was growing up, my family never talked about the family history. So I got the impression that there was a long, dark tunnel that they came through to reach Japan from Korea. And when they reached Japan, they closed up the entrance, entrance to the, the tunnel as well as the exit. So there's no evidence to know what actually happened in the tunnel. I asked myself why I am in Japan, and I was born in Japan. And in order to get the answer to my questions, I felt that I have to go through the tunnel myself. When I first started writing, I was 18 years old. Now I'm 55, so I've been writing for the past 40 years. But when I started writing at the age of 18, the first story that I really wanted to write was about my grandfather. When I was 18, although I had the desire to write the story about my grandfather, I didn't have the courage nor the ability to express myself by writing. When I wrote this story, I was already 30 years old. And the end of August has countless characters, almost all Koreans, living in the city of Niryang under Japanese colonial rule. What what kind of research did you have to do for that time period? The book was written 20 years ago, as you know. Back then, there were still people living who knew about the war and what life was like back then. So I went around asking stories from them, and I asked people who knew my grandfather and about the town, and uh, asked them what it was like. And I took pretty detailed information down from them. The comfort women is a big element in my story. So when I was in Miryan, actually I visited and uh, asked questions. I met with them and talked with them and found out uh, their experiences. In total, I think I 
probably interviewed about 100 people. These、uh, elderly people speak or spoke Japanese because they lived through the colonial era that was under Japan's rule. When they were growing up, they were forced to study in Japanese schools, and the education was all Japanese. They were prohibited from speaking Korean, they had to change their names to the Japanese names. So, when I actually interviewed these people, the experiencing of communicating with them in Japanese was difficult because I felt that the language that I was, was using was wounded as well as their language, which was also wounded on both sides. The gold、uh, medalist Song Ji, who won the gold medal in Berlin, the, the Berlin Olympics, was a friend of my grandfather. I met him in Seoul. He was glad to see me, to see the granddaughter of his friend, and he was happy that、um, he had lived long enough to be able to, to do so. However, he also commented how he was only speaking to me in Japanese because you only speak Japanese. I wish we could communicate in Korean. And when he said that, I just broke down and cried. So, in other words, you could say that the story is about pain written by the language that's been wounded. The novel opens with you, Yumiri, participating in a gut with three mudangs and one paksu, the Korean shamans, and hearing from your family members who have passed away. What did it mean to you to speak for, or speak to, or speak for the dead? Or arousing sort of the voice of the dead in the beginning of your novel? I consider most of the people that are important in my life, most of the people that I have relationships with, are actually dead people.、Mm. My existence today is upon the infinite chains of dead lives. And I consider it like, the,、uh, one li like a chain of lives, one after another, that were woven into this thread which led me to my existence today. So, in other words, the dead lives inside of me. For example, my grandfather and all these other、um, family members, my ancestors, they all live inside of me and they are the flesh and blood of my existence itself.、Mm. My belief is that when somebody dies, that person's life. Does not become empty or、um, disappear all completely. There are always something that remains of the person's life. For example, the person's voice or the sound of the voice. I think those things live on. So, as a writer, I feel like my duty is to listen to the sound of the,、um, the voice of the dead people and write them down. Iu Chal, your maternal grandfather, is shown as a running prodigy who is a contender for the upcoming Olympics in the novel. You mentioned that he was actually a friend of、um, Song Gi Jung.、Um, you yourself, from what I know, is a runner.、Um, and there is this sense of Iu Chal running in order to accomplish something, but also he's Trying to outrun something as well in this novel. Why、um, 
Why did you decide to use running as an important motif in this novel? When I decided to write this novel, at first I started researching volumes of history books and uh, other references, but I just couldn't stop writing anything. My grandfather, after Korea was liberated from Japan's rule and then the Korean War started, um, he really had these hardships before he came to Japan as a refugee. And through all, the, all these hardships, running was the one thing that he never gave up on. So um, one month before the series started, I think it was in 2000 and 2001, that I ran the Seoul uh, Marathon. Mm. That was when I actually first started running. I never did before. After the marathon, I started writing. When I ran the full marathon, this is what I thought. Running means that you have to keep moving forward. You have to put one foot after another, but you just have to keep going forward. In the marathon, at about 30 kilometers, your body and your uh, spirit almost give up. It reaches its limit. You still have to keep going forward. You have to tell yourself, move forward. And then, of course, the uh, goal is to reach the goal of the marathon, which you could say that the goal is also a type of hope, something that you run to reach. But then, once you reach the goal, what then? Is it really the end of everything? That is it the ultimate goal that you don't have to move forward anymore? So that is the type of question that I wanted to imply at the end of the novel. I hopefully that the readers can pick up on it and you know, take it home and think about it. Also in this novel, Names seem to signify many things. You write, for example, a name is the shortest and the longest story in the world, that nothing is heavier than a name, that if you don't say a name, it will die out. So what is the significance of one's name to you, especially, especially when you lived with and you are living with Korean name in Japan all your life. So what does a name mean to you? Mm. The names for the Korean people are something that were taken away from them. Historically, you look at all these colonized uh, countries around the world, and you hardly hear about a, a colonized territory and its people whose names have completely been decimated or taken away or prohibited the use of. I think it's pretty unheard of. So in terms of my name, you, my family name, is something that's been handed down from the ancestry, so it has the history. Miri is a name that my grandfather gave me. It's very special. Um, a name of a person is something very special that should not be taken away. It means because it means taking away that person's dignity. The Korean American people in the United States, I think, have a, a slightly different situation. If when you compare the Korean American people to the Zainichi people in Japan, the Zainichi people had to 
survive the complicated historical backgrounds, the pre-war situations always followed them. They had to live with all the complications of uh, the historical complications. And because of the discrimination that they had to suffer, a lot of people were hiding their own um, their real names, and they used the Japanese names just to make things easier for themselves. Even today, there are quite a few people who use Japanese names instead of Korean names. I chose to use my Korean name, and I write as a novelist. My hope is that by doing so, maybe um, using a Korean name could be a catalyst to something new, that it would throw questions at the, the readers and people in general. The Zainichi people live on the inside, however they are always on the outside. So, in one sense, they are almost like the windows to the outside, or a hole that you could see through to the outside. My hope is that my name is somehow going to be a question for people to motivate themselves, motivate them to think about the situation. One thing I did not mention in the introduction is that you also trained as an actor and playwright before you began writing novels. How did that training influence your writing? My life has always been a, a series of choices that I didn't strategically make. It wasn't something that I, I could choose out of many choices, but they were the only choice that were in front of me. For example, I became an actress and I decided to go into theater at the age of 16, but that was because in junior high school, I couldn't go to the school anymore. I stopped going. And in the first year of high school, I was kicked out of the high school. So at the when I was 16, the only choice I had was, well, maybe I will become an actress. I will do theater. Mm. And I have never really thought about the influence of the training upon my writing. So I, let me think about it. When I first became an actress, I had to get up on stage and I had to communicate something to the audience through my voice. So it was an ex expression through one's voice, which continued as, as I became uh, a playwright also. I wrote something that would uh, bring the actors to communicate something to the audience through their voice. So in that way, I guess there's a commonality between uh, my training as an actress and playwright in um, what I do as a writer. So in my books, The Ueno Station and The End of August, there are many voices of many people, the real, vo real voices of the people who are living today. I think my role here is to receive their voices and write them into the stories. So we mentioned that the end of August was actually written in the early 2000s. Where were you in your career when you wrote this? And what did it mean to you to write a novel that was serialized in both Japanese and Korean newspapers? Hmm. I made my debut as a writer at the age of 18, which was pretty young. And I have written many books, but there's this one book that was published in Japan called Life, and it's a nonfiction about my experience as a single mother giving birth to my son um, after soon after that, my partner died of cancer. That book sold about uh, a million copies in Japan and became a bestseller. And uh, I wrote this book, The August, right after that. 
それが日本で100万部のベストセラーになって、えー、その後ぐらいでしたね。So what did it mean to you to write a novel that was serialized in both Japanese and Korean newspapers? As,、oh, um, okay. The, uh, mm. Also, mm. what were the sort of the biggest challenge in writing mm. Uh, mm. a serialized novel?、Mm. やはり、えー、この植民地時代というのは、この時代に、日本と韓国の国際的な違いがあるので、日本と韓国の国際的な違いがあるので、日本と韓国の国際的な違いがあるので、日本と韓国の国際的な違いがあるので、日本と韓国の国際的な違いがあるので、日本と韓国の国際的な違いがあるので、That sensitive times is the, theme, the background of the story. So, when I was writing, it wasn't like writing a long story that would eventually become a book, but it was almost like w r i t e a page each time and、um, rip the page off and throw the page at both the Korean audience and the Japanese audience. So there was a level of anxiety or nervousness about doing so. The Japanese,、uh, the story was、um, published in Towa, Nippo, and Korea. I can talk about it calmly now, but when I was writing, it was almost like a battle. When I was writing this story, Which were published in,、um, in those newspapers. Lots of letters of protest came to the newspaper companies, which they forwarded to me for me to see. There were so many protests, especially about the depiction of the comfort women, a lot of readers felt that it was too much. But many readers also consider the novel to be very personal and its narrative structure. Very challenging and unconventional.、Um, what did it mean to you to write this novel when you did in a way that it was written? And do you think your writing has evolved or changed since writing this novel? I don't have any concept of what style that I'm going to write when I start writing a story. I don't even come up with a plot. Beforehand, I just start writing. It's almost like I take a piece of blank,、um, a blank piece of paper, and I paint words upon the piece of paper, and it becomes a story. Right now, I, I write on my smartphone. So,、um, oftentimes, The story, once it's finished, makes me realize what the story is about. It's almost like that. It's not that I pick up a style and try out different styles. So, for this、um, novel, I didn't pick a style. But a lot of times, the stories tell me where to go and、uh, what they are after they're finished. So, as A Zainichi Korean.、Mm. How do you grapple with this concept of national identity?、Mm. Well, where you were born and how you were raised, and you know, the culture you were raised versus what is sort of imposed on you?、Mm. It's complicated.、Mm. In my consciousness, I'm neither Japanese nor Korean. An identity is something that oftentimes people think that one has naturally. For example, you're either a, a woman or a man, or you're a mother, or you're some,、uh, a doer of a certain activity, or you're from which country, things like that. But I always maintain the idea of my identity being non identity, which is neither nor. When the relationship between Japan and Korea is good, then they call me a bridge that spans two different cultures. When the relationship 
is bad, including the, uh, the relationship between Japan and North Korea. People are not very kind to me, and they send attacking messages on SNS. For example, some, somebody might say, go back to Korea, take your son, and go home. But despite all those uh, challenges, I'm determined to stay and stand on the bridge between the two places. I have the determination, and I intend to maintain the courage to do so. When um, Russia started invading Ukraine, a lot of images of war were seen on TV. And then I thought, a bridge is something that is the first to go when the war starts. Even from the f defense side and on the offense side, the bridge is something that they want to destroy first. But I believe that there's something that you can see only from the bridge. If you stand on the bridge, you can see something that you cannot see when you are off the bridge and inside their own territory. Like many authors and writers, you own a bookstore. Um, but you opened it at a very specific place at a very specific time. You moved to Minami Soma, one of the Fukushima villages that were evacuated after the nu nuclear disaster of 2011. And you opened a bookstore there, and I believe you lived there. Um, can you tell us mm. why you did it? Mm. In Japan, there aren't many bookstores that are run by writers. I think I was the only one, and until I recently saw on the news that there was one other bookstore that um, another writer just opened. The reason why I opened the bookstore within the 20 kilometer radius of what used to be an area that was totally evacuated for the danger of ra radiation is because I was, a, a, as a volunteer, I was teaching the high school students from the evacuated area in a makeshift facility, and I was teaching writing and expression through writing. In July of 2016, the uh, government said that it was okay for the residents to go back to the area. But before the, before people were able to move in, they first moved the high school and they reopened the high school in the area so that the students could go back to the school location and study. But there was nothing else. There are no stores, anything like that. From the town that I was volunteering at, there were 10 students. Um, who would commute to that high school um, that reopened. But there were four, 490 students that would take uh, trains to get to the high school in Oraka. So the commute was long for them. When they finished school and they got, they were on their way home, it would be dark. I thought, this is unbelievable that they had to go through this. So I thought maybe I could be like um, a vendor, fortune teller <laughs> type of place and open the bookstore for them so that there's a place like a refuge for them to um, stop by and rest and relax if they need to. The station where the high school is is a um, doesn't have any staff, no um, kiosk, nothing like that. The trains there are not like New York subways. If you miss a train, you might have to wait for two hours for the next train. The reason why I decided to open a bookstore as opposed to anything else 
Um, there are two reasons. First, when I was teaching these high school students, I learned how much they uh, were given as their monthly allowance that they could use freely. And it was 3,000 yen per month, which is not a lot at all. And I thought, a bookstore is a place where you don't have to buy anything, and they can stay there, they can browse through the books and magazines, and they have chairs to sit. The second reason is evacuation of the books, so to speak. Those people when tsunami hit their town, their houses were all um, destroyed, along with all the books that they had. Those who lived in uh, the area close to the nuclear disaster, they had to give up on their books because they were uh, contaminated with radiation. These are the people who lost everything, including books. I saw a woman who came into my store and they were look, she was looking at these books um, lined up on the bookshelves. She picked up one, she put her hand on her chest and said, how beautiful, and she cried. I believe that um, when you open the cover of a book, the cover in Japanese is called a door. There are many doors in this one small space, many doors to the world that you can open and go to different places. In Fukushima, there was despair, and I hope that the bookstore becomes a place where they can find hope. So you have written over 20 books, but this is the second of your books to be translated into English. Mm -hmm. um, was this your choice, or mm -hmm. did Morgan Guile mm -hmm. suggest it that mm -hmm. this could be the next project for her? How did you work with your translator? Morgan um, Morgan was the one who picked this book, and I was surprised at her choice, because she actually picked two of the most difficult um, books to translate, I thought. Um, in the Tokyo station, there's a dialect from a specific shopping area called Hamadori, which is like the beach street mm. in Minami Soma. And I didn't know how she was going to tackle translating the dialect. And with the end of August, mm -hmm. there's Korean words that are used, the Hangul writing as well. So I didn't know how she, how she was going to translate the book. She ended up studying Korean. I still don't understand why she picked this story, so I would love, love to interview her and ask her why. This is your um, last day in New York City. You just came back from sort of a book tour in the United States. Mm -hmm. I believe it is your first time meeting your English mm -hmm. readers since mm -hmm. when um, Tokyo mm -hmm. Weno Station came out during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, what was that experience like to be here meeting your English readers? Mm -hmm. In Japan, the book is considered something very specific and special about the Zainichi people. But when I traveled this time in the United States and uh, communicated with the, the readers in Pittsburgh, I even went to Princeton. I met people of diverse background and a lot of people whose parents are from different cultures as well. These people are standing on the bridge, going back to my, um, you know, that I mentioned about being on the bridge earlier. For them, it, this is their story. This is the story of those who stand on the bridge. 
when I found out that this was uh, how they, um, what their perception was about the story, I was happily um, surprised. And I, I'm so glad that I wrote this book. Well, I think that's a great way to end this. So on that note, thank you so much once again for joining us today. It's an honor to have you here. Bon voyage um, for your next um, travel. Then we hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. See you again. <laughs>